Hello, and welcome to the Ancient Warfare Podcast. My name is Mark DeSantis, and loyal listeners may recognize me as a longtime member of the podcast panel. Today, however, I'll be hosting this episode in which I talk with my esteemed colleague, Murray Dom, the assistant editor of Ancient Warfare magazine, about his latest book, Barbarian War- Warrior versus Roman Legionary, Marcomannic Wars, AD 165 to 180, out now from Osprey. So without further delay, let's enter the arena. We who are about to chat salute you. Um, well, yes, I believe uh, it's out. It's out uh, as you watch this, uh, even even the earliest watch. Yeah, hold that up again for us, uh, if you don't mind. I'll, oh, I'll that's zoom wonderful. Into the camera. Barbarian warrior versus Roman leg- legionary. Fantastic. Yes, yes, exactly. So um, that's uh, the latest. The latest combat in uh, the latest in the combat series for Osprey. Yeah. And, and what is the the combat series? So, so the combat series takes two uh, belligerents um, in in a series of wars. Uh, so it can be an infantryman, a cavalryman, and we'll look at them in isolation. So look at a Roman legionary equipment, recruitment, leadership, uh, organization, and look at them both to uh, sort of in comparison and then explore three major conflicts between those two belligerents when they met in three separate battles and explore the battle accounts and then how those two belligerents performed in those battles. So in most cases, of course, what you've got is you're focusing on the the theme of the issue. So it's the infantryman versus the infantryman. And so, yes, there are cavalry involved. Yes, there are other forces involved. And so when you're dealing with the battle account, you have to bring those other forces in. But the main focus is on what are those two types of infantry doing in that battle and how are they performing. Based and on- these are set during the Marcomannic Wars. Why don't you tell us about the Mar- Marcomannic Wars? Uh, when did they occur? W- where did they occur? What what was the theater of combat? The Marcomannic Wars is across the Danube, uh, the, the tribes of the Marcomanni and the Quadi and the, Sarma- the Sarmatai or the Sarmatians. Uh, and also the Dacians come in as well. So they're the Danube frontier in the Roman Empire. So what is modern day uh, Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, and and further north? Um, so the fascinating thing about, and I've, I've done a separate little Ancient Warfare Answers podcast on this, is that Marcus Aurelius is the fifth of the five good emperors, as we call them today, beginning with Nerva. So Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus, Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. And Marcus Aurelius comes to power in 161 AD. And the fascinating thing with that is that when he comes to power, everything rebels in the Roman Empire. There are wars in Germany, wars in Britain, wars in Africa, wars in... There's usurpers in the East, uh, and there's, there's the... Sarmatian Marcomannic Wars. What happens is uh, when Marcus Aurelius is adopted, um, he's adopted at the same time as Lucius Verus. And fascinating, Lucius Verus's father had been adopted by Hadrian. So Lucius Verus was meant to be kind of lined up earlier. And so Antoninus Pius adopts both Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus. When Marcus Aurelius becomes emperor, he immediately adopts his brother, his adoptive brother, as co-emperor. And that sets up a whole series of what I think are much more literary contrasts than reality contrasts. So from Marcus Aurelius' perspective, his brother is is equal co-emperor. From our perspective, Marcus Aurelius is the good emperor, and Lucius Verus, therefore, by default, is the bad emperor, because he needs to be the wastrel to the philosopher successful Marcus Aurelius. Whereas in reality, it would probably be that Marcus Aurelius was indeed more interested in philosophy. Uh, we've got, you know, letters between Marcus Aurelius and Marcus Cornelius Fronto, who's his rhetoric tutor, and lamenting the fact that Marcus Aurelius is no longer interested in rhetoric, but is going to the, you know, the competitive foreign idea of philosophy instead. And, and Marcus Fronto laments the fact that he's lost the emperor to, to philosophy rather than the joys of rhetoric. Now, Marcus Aurelius, he took a, a, a direct role in the wars. and uh, Was he exceptional in that regard? The issue is that 
Um, so, so finishing on from what I was saying, Ma, um, Lucius Verus seems to be the military emperor and is sent to command the Parthian War, which is fought between 162 and 165. And then he and Lucius Verus, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus, go to fight the Marcomannic War both together. And unfortunately, in 169, Lucius Verus dies uh, on the probably in Aquilia, um, up north in Italy. And so that kind of throws the whole thing into a into a spin, and Marcus Aurelius is left to command the wars. Now, one of the criticisms made of, of emperors who we don't like, Domitian and, and Lucius Verus especially, is, oh, they, they commanded the war, but they actually didn't command the war in person. They commanded it through subordinates, whereas Trajan... And Marcus Aurelius, they commanded the war. You're like, Trajan and Marcus Aurelius commanded the war through subordinates. They did nothing different from Lucius Verus and Domitian, except in our estimation, they're good emperors, not bad emperors. So there really is no difference between a Marcus Aurelius commanding through subordinates and a Lucius Verus commanding through subordinates, or indeed a Trajan commanding through subordinates and a Domitian commanding through subordinates, except in the way that the historical sources frame it which is, oh, he's there, but he's not doing anything. Whereas, you know, when the good emperor's always oh, there, he's commanding in person, you're like, hang on, these are exactly the same scenario, uh, and they're just spun into a positive or a negative. And so that's that's quite frustrating because the 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 sort of the literary artificial portrait of the emperor as robust, energetic military commander is is really artificial uh they're they're no less robust or energetic than than the bad emperor they're you know on the front both are at the front both are commanding armies but the actual day-to-day -day soldiering is being done by subordinates this the sources for the marcomannic wars are fragmentary in the extreme why is that and how did you go about researching these wars considering how how little you had to go on Exactly. Um, so the main literary source would be the the epitome uh, or the histories of Dio Cassius or Cassius Dio, uh, and they don't survive really in very good uh, amounts for Marcus Aurelius's wars, which is frustrating. And we know of several sources that were written that got lost um, and haven't been refound. Uh, again, coming back to maybe they're somewhere waiting to be rediscovered. And so you've got a very general summation of the wars, which is why when you read various modern accounts of these wars, the chronology is thrown because there's no real clear indication of when these battles occur. Uh, the bit that survives in Diocassius is lumped together as here's some memorable moments from the wars. So he takes 15 years of war and throws them into like a single paragraph. And so we're not sure when each occurs in comparison to the others. And you'll find several alternate chronologies of when things occur. Again, you pretty much have to choose one chronology for that, and I've done that. Um, and so there may be people go, but hang on, didn't this occur in a different chronology? Yes, it may have, but but you have to, um, you can't, and you can't hedge your bets the whole time. <laughs> Secondly, and I make the point in the book that whereas when we've got a, a Tacitus or a Herodotus, for instance, that can be a fabulous narrative of a, of, a, of a war. And you don't look at alternative sources because, or you only occasionally look at alternative sources to corroborate what your main source says. In our case, we don't have the main source. We only have these uh, incidental secondary sources, which may corroborate a main source that we no longer actually have access to. And so they instead become the main sources, dissatisfying though they may be, and liminal though they are. So we've got a, a dialogue of Lucian, for instance, which is an attack on a religious charlatan and uh, a guy named Alexander, the false prophet. And basically that has the anecdotal detail of a battle, uh, a loss, a, 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 a Marcomannic victory over the, uh, the the Roman legions that we don't get anywhere else or only vaguely referred to. And so we use Lucian as a, becomes a core source. And then that's corroborated later by Marcus, uh, by Ammianus Marcellinus, 
talking about the defeat. So in one case, you've got a source which is exactly contemporary, mentioning a defeat that no one else mentions. And then you've got a fourth century, late fourth century Roman historian, uh, you know, writing 200 years later, corroborating that defeat. And so you use those two and go, this defeat happened. Whereas if you're just referring to the to the the major historians of the period, they don't mention it. Uh, you've then got the issue of another source of the SHA or the Scriptores Historiae Augustae, uh, which is why it's abbreviated to SHA, because no one can be bothered saying that big, long title, which is normally regarded as a really unreliable source mentioning things. And so you've got to go, no one else mentions it, this really terrible source does mention it, what do we do with the reliability of that source mentioning something? How do we, what do we do to look at it? And so it's it's a it's a it's a more of a jigsaw than normal in terms of the source material because you're really taking it's like you've got a single piece and you plunk it in the middle of a blank space and you go okay well that piece seems to be the right piece but I have nothing around it. How do you build the what's around it uh, based on you know very. Uh, non-existent literary sources. Now, I say literary You have to sources. become a Sherlock Holmes and take all of the evidence that you can find and get in as much as you can. And, and, and apart, apart from the literary evidence, whatever the state that is, uh, you make reference to archaeological, numismatic, and other evidence. What, what role did that play in researching? So your in this case, especially, again, um, very often those sources can be used in a normal circumstance to corroborate a literary account. In this circumstance, we don't have the literary account. And so you have these independent uh, epigraphical, uh, archaeological and, and um, you know, architectural survivals as well as numismatics. And they can absolutely help with the chronology. They can absolutely help with the what units are available. And several of the inscriptions for the Marcomannic Wars give us more information than we ever have in the source material. And so you suddenly get you know the career uh, of a of a soldier who's not mentioned in any literary source, but has two surviving inscriptions from different parts of the Roman Empire, and you're like, well, this person clearly knew what they were involved uh, in a, in a very intimate way, and so you've also got and with the, with with the Marcomannic Wars, very unusually, you've got the survival of the column of Marcus Aurelius, which is a vastly tall sculptural relief, uh, you know, second only to Trajan's column in terms of depicting uh, a Roman army at war. And it's the Marcomannic Wars that are depicted on that column. We believe that it's built, I think the first literary evidence of it is soon after Marcus Aurelius's death in the reign of Commodus. And so it's built as a commemoration of the wars. But can it can it be used as a narrative of the wars? There are those who say yes. And then you're looking at it and you're like, well, maybe not. <laughs> because again, the chronology of the wars doesn't quite fit with the huge number of scenes on the column. Because, you you know, there are those who say that this is the wars from uh, 169 onwards. And then there are those who say, no, no, this is the wars from only 175 onwards. So it's only the last five years of the wars. And there are varying arguments for that. One that, you know, Lucius Verus isn't depicted. Um, another that, you know, there's this very hard to put one of the battles. So the miracle of the rain, which is one of the battles I look at, is one of the very, uh, you know, most identifiable scenes on the column. Let me see if I can find a picture of the miracle of the rain, uh, because you've got the personification of the rain falling on the soldiers. So it's very obviously that battle that's being referred to. The problem becomes that it's quite early on the column. And so is it therefore early in the wars that the battle, that the, you know, the column is depicting, or is it in fact, where are we? I thought I had one in there. There's my, there's my lovely artwork of the Miracle of the Rain. Hopefully you can see the, the rain falling uh, as the, the Romans are, uh, their thirst is slaked at the time, same time as the, the barbarians attack. And... I can't find it in the book. The Miracle of the Rain. Um, if you look up, so the Miracle of the, of the Rain, and and you uh, pick two other uh, battles. Uh, what were they, and how did you go about choosing these battles for inclusion? Well, in this case, the 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 battles are 
kind of dictated by what is there enough to make a narrative of. So the three I choose are the first one is the one that Lucian tells us, which is the the Battle of Car Carnuntum, which is the defeat of the the Roman garrison and and the invasion of Italy, which is a big deal. You know, this this Marco Man Accord starts coming into Italy, and that that's technically the first invasion of Italy since the Mar uh, the the Teutones and Cimbri in the late second century BC. This is a big deal, uh, and you know. Italy is threatened, and the the you know this huge response to to deal with the problem, um, and the problem is when do you place it? And I've placed it at one seventy. Some people place it earlier or, or later. I put it in one seventy. Then I've used the miracle of the rain, which I uh, date to. Do I date to one seven four? I think. Do I? Do I? Do I date to that? I've got all these alternate dates. So can't onto my date to one seventy. Uh, sorry, battle. Uh, then the battle on the ice, I put in one seven two, and then the miracle of the rain in one seven four. So the 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 battle on the ice is an interesting one where we do have uh, a surviving narrative anecdote, for lack of a better term, where the retreating Sarmatians and Marco Manai uh, retreat across the frozen Danube, and the Romans are lured into the middle of the river. The, the the Sarmatians then turn around and attack the Romans on the ice. And uh, it's it's fascinating because clearly the the Romans have fallen into a Sarmatian tactic or a, a ploy, but they gather together and we're told that the uh, half the soldiers pass their shields forward and place them on the ice and the Romans in the front rank stand on those shields, which gives them a secure footing. And so they withstand the charges of the of the barbarians and are able to defeat them. And that's fascinating in itself. Uh, it's also a close, very deliberately described as a close order defense, which is, again, fascinating. That's also a, a kind of a punishment by Marcus Aurelius of when the, the, the Marco Manai attack Italy in 170, they gather resources and go to cross over the Danube to punish the um, the barbarians for daring to attack Rome, which is a very Roman thing to do. It's also, you know, the idea that the, the Danube is frozen is a fascinating aspect of Roman military relations with the peoples north of the Danube, because the Danube doesn't freeze every winter. Uh, some pictures of the, you know, if you read Ovid, it's like, the the Danube freezes solid every week uh, and stays you know, the way the way that the way that Ovid describes it in the early first century BC is that the Danube stays frozen for years, <laughs> never 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 thaws. Um, but I think you know uh, using geography geology, you can see that the the Danube doesn't freeze all that often. It's a quite unusual occurrence. I think at the time that Ovid is in exile from eight BC through to eighteen AD, it froze over four times. And then, you know, it freezes over famously in 406 and, and, and 405, we're not uh, sure. Apart from the military uh, aspects, uh, uh, the direct military aspects, how were the Marcomannic Wars affected by unexpected events? Uh, I'm thinking of the Antonine Plague of 165. So many, so, or the, so many, so many. Right, um, the revolt of Avidius Cassius. To delve into right. those a bit. So the problem is... Rome has just fought a Parthian war, which they've won. And so the the army returning from Parthia in 165 with uh, with Lucius Verus brings plague back with it. And even, even in the post-COVID world, the Antonine Plague is in the top 10, you know, plagues of humanity in terms of death toll. And uh, we think it begins in Ctesiphon, the, the Parthian capital, and is brought back. Uh, or is it Seleucia? Might be Seleucia, I'm not sure. And brought back to Rome by the returning legions. Now, one of the aspects of the Marcus of the Marcus Aurelian military is it begins several aspects of later uh, military practice. And it seems that they begin with Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus, which because of the nature of the sources is hard to identify. But the first thing is rather than whole legions going on campaign, vexillations of legions 
uh, which always existed. You know, when you go back to the AD 69 Civil War, there are vexillations being used, but it would seem, so a vexillation is a detachment from a legion. So the legion will still be based in a particular area, but a vexillation of, you know, up to half might go and fight a different war somewhere else. And so what we've got is, uh, you know, this legion is based here. But in fact, the troops from that legion are, are fighting elsewhere. And so what happens in the wars of Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus is that those legions are dispatched to the east. They then return in 165. Unknown to them, they are, of course, infected. And when they then return to their home bases, they infect them too. And so you get a huge impact of the plague killing, uh, I think, 10% of the population, um, up to 24%, I think, is some of the estimations. But there's a manpower crisis. And so we have anecdotes of, of Marcus Aurelius, like during the, the Punic Wars, enlisting gladiators into the legions, enlisting slaves into the legions, and, and essentially getting any money can to fight. And so there's that manpower crisis, which is a really interesting aspect of the the, the reason that the wars start so badly for the Romans that they they you know they lose at Carnuntum perhaps because of a manpower crisis. Um, you then have the issue of auxiliaries being uh, employed. So you know, and in the third century AD onwards, and and especially in the fourth, you've got the the crisis of the barbarization of the army that the Romans are relying on employed auxiliaries and what become foderati. Or, or treaty troops, based on the word foidus, meaning treaty. So there's an agreement with the barbarian tribe to fight for the Roman Empire. And that's, you know, that becomes a big factor in 4th century warfare especially. But in Marcus Aurelius's wars, he seems to be doing that as well. And so it seems that that's where it starts. And it becomes a problem later, but it's really Marcus Aurelius who begins it. And he's forced to because of a manpower issue because of the plague. But what he does do that the Romans learn not to do later is he starts using auxiliary troops in the same region where they have been enlisted. So he's using Germanic and Dacian tribes to fight against other Germanic and Dacian tribes. And on the one hand, they do this because they want to continue their own uh, intertribal warfare. So they will fight their enemies within the context of Roman warfare. And that also causes some problems. We have a, a tribe entering into the Roman Empire who get annihilated by a auxiliary tribe for no reason other than, well, they were our sort of traditional enemies and therefore we killed them all. Didn't we do a good thing? Well, no, because we let them into the empire as allies and you've gone and killed them. <laughs> what are we going to do about that? Um, and so... You've also got the issue, of course, of the opposite problem, which Rome had seen before uh, in, in Arminius and, and, and others. And that is, of course, if you've got auxiliaries with affiliations within the area they're operating, they may coordinate with the enemy uh, than, rather than with the Romans. And probably because of, again, this manpower crisis, uh, Marcus Aurelius is forced to ignore that and employ auxiliaries wherever they are. And so that becomes a problem as well. Um, that they may be coordinating and cooperating with the enemy because they're tribally affiliated with them. And and the Romans had troubles with their own armies. That is, there was the real revolt of uh, the governor, uh, Vidius Cassius. What was what happened there? So what, you all, what you've had, uh, it's, it's fabulous because it's so, it's a thing that covers almost every emperor, and yet it all happens to Marcus Aurelius. You know, Marcus Aurelius is the most philosophical of Roman emperors. We've got his meditations uh, or his conversations with myself. And yet he spends more time at the front than any other emperor. Um, you know, he's he's at the front continuously for 15 years. And, you know, the most military Roman emperor doesn't spend that long at the front. Anyway, um, what happens, of course, is when uh, at the beginning of the, the, the reign of Marcus Aurelius, 161, there's all of these revolts, Britain, Africa, Germany, uh, the Parthian War. Because Rome is weakest when an emperor dies and the new emperors haven't yet established their claim. And so all of those revolts happen. 
Lucius Verus dies in 169. And then in 175, there's a false rumor of Marcus Aurelius's death. And that's what leads to the revolt of Avidius Cassius. That the idea that the emperors di died, the empire is now weak and vulnerable. Who's going to take over? And Avidius Cassius is fascinating because he was one of the generals of Lucius Verus's Parthian War. So he's a very loyal general until he usurps and he's no longer a loyal general. And so Marcus Aurelius is forced to break off the Marcomannic War and go to the east to defeat Avidius Cassius. Now, he gets to the east and Avidius Cassius has already been assassinated by his own troops, probably when they learn that Marcus Aurelius is in fact not dead. And so the whole reason for the usurpation was false anyway. But then the problem is that okay, you've got this instability in the Roman Empire, and rather than rush back to the uh, to the front, Marcus Aurelius and Commodus, who's with him by that point, uh, they spend time showing their face around the East and in Athens. Uh, both, you know, Marcus Aurelius is uh, initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries in, in that period. And I think that's much more about re-establishing his connection with the East, which he hasn't been to for such a long time in you know, his campaigning. Uh, and again, I think one of the issues there, and it's one of the fascinating things that's more political than military and can't really deal with in a book that's you know, limited by its scope, Antoninus Pius doesn't leave Rome. He doesn't go anywhere. You know, Hadrian's famous for this tour, but Antoninus Pius hasn't been seen in the empire. And that also is a destabilizing aspect of ruling an empire in absentia. And so I think what Marcus Aurelius does after the revolt of Avidius Cassius is he realizes, oh, I do need to show my face. And more than that, I need to show the face of the heir apparent, Commodus, who again is a bad emperor. And we in hindsight go, why did Marcus Aurelius stop adopting the best candidate? So Commodus is regarded as a bad emperor. Um, and why did Marcus Aurelius abandon the idea of adopting the best candidate? And I think one of the things about that is that, yes, there have been four good emperors and five good emperors with Marcus Aurelius, but Marcus Aurelius is, uh, inherits a whole bunch of crises. And that, I think, displays to him that maybe this method we've been using since Nerva hasn't worked that well. Maybe it's time to try something different. And unlike the predecessors, you know, only... Hadrian has children. He has a daughter. Marcus Aurelius has 14 children. So he absolutely smashes that example out the window. And he selects Commodus to be his heir. Commodus turns out to be a, a terrible emperor, gets assassinated in 193. Uh, you know, when he's assassinated, we get the year of the five emperors, which no one ever remembers. There's another year in, is it 235? The year of the six emperors. You know, we all, we always talk about the year of the four emperors in 69 AD. There are worse crises to come for Rome. But the reality is that he shows Commodus as his heir apparent. He's with him at the front. He's being trained to have military command. He's got the same advisors that Marcus Aurelius trusts. And so he goes on this tour of the East with Marcus Aurelius. And I think that's to show that this is the guy who will be replacing me. Yeah, there, there's a lot that has to... You know, go into one of these books that is you're and you could write a book about every topic that you're bringing up over the last hour or so how do you decide what goes into one of these osprey combat titles and what to leave out well what to leave out is always the issue and, and and as in all my combats the first draft is massively over the word count uh my favorite phrase of i think it was 2021 was redeploy text the, the combat series has a, a specific word count for each section. Uh, so you've got the two armies, that you've got the organization, and, and you've got to do a sort of an equal amount of words on the organization of the barbarians and the organization of the Romans. In which case, like, oh, we know a great deal about the organization of the Roman legion, very little about the organization of the Marcomannic tribes. How do you balance 600 words on each, for instance? So in that sense, you're actually leaving out a lot <clears throat> for the Romans in order to balance that you haven't got 10 pages for Rome and a paragraph for the, for the, for the, for the barbarians. So you've got to choose which bits to keep in. You've got the ability to, in some cases, move some of that text elsewhere. You've also got the captions to the 
images. So uh, every combat title has 75 photographs and the captions, as I learned, are a maximum of 200 words. And so you can redeploy some of the text that you can't use in the paragraphs into the captions. What I've since discovered, of course, is that when you know that, every caption becomes 200 words. And you're like, oh, no, can't do that. So in, in some cases, however, the caption isn't, well, in all cases, the caption is not a restating of what you've said in the, in the text. It's new information. It's vital information as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's not yeah. it's not a supplement to what you've already said. It's 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 additional. And what you can find is that um often a really important point that didn't fit into the main word limit of a of a paragraph is in the caption, which will go in that section. So you can find original material that's vital to the argument in the caption rather than in the text because there's just not the room in the text. So what was the outcome of the Mark Omanic Wars and, and what did they mean for the future of the Roman Empire? The amazing thing about these wars is um, the first thing, of course, is that Dacia, the, the Roman province across the Danube, uh, which becomes very vulnerable because it's now on enemy territory, is you know the last province created under under Trajan after his Trajan Trajan's Dacian campaign and it's the first one abandoned in the in the third century so it's the shortest lived Roman province it, it's the last made and the first left but the big anti-climax of the Marcomannic Wars is Marcus Aurelius has done all this effort to fight these wars for a very long time from 165 onwards when he dies he tells Commodus, who's on the front, who's in command. When he comes back from the east, his consul gets married. It's like, he's the guy. Commodus immediately ignores all of Marcus Aurelius's advisors and generals, fires them all, and makes a unfavorable peace with the, the barbarians and immediately casts himself as the bad emperor. You know, he's, he's far more concerned. You know, anyone who's watching this or listening to this will, of course, remember Gladiator uh, with, with uh, Joaquin Phoenix as, as Commodus, which is inaccurate and and, and wrong. But, you know, uh, what could you do? Do, do the Marcomanni re reappear, though, in the future? Because it seems that the Marcomanni, uh, to my recollection, are not the threat uh, going forward that the Goths and, or other... Uh, They're essentially uh, eliminated uh, as a threat. One of the things about the tribal confederations and manifestations across the Danube is that they're not well understood. And whenever they're presented as being well understood, that's a that's a, a, a misstatement, that their vague boundaries, they shift, peoples come into power and leave power. You know, we have the names of tribes like the Costa Bokoi, uh, the Marcomanni and other tribes, the Dacians, which is very much a generic term. And, and sometimes it's used as a, as a specific term, the Daishi. And you're like, is that or is that vague? Uh, the Sarmatai, the Sarmatians, again, are a vague term rather than a specific term. And so you'll find maps where they've got these very specific borders. Better maps are the ones that have sort of vague spheres of influence, if you like. But those are waxing and waning. And, and indeed, the Marco Manites seem to sort of disappear. Although, do they completely disappear? Probably not but they're not really... Perhaps they were absorbed into other confederations that were more successful or what have you. And I don't know that this is this turns into a... It begins as a war of defence because the, the, the Marco Manai raid over the Danube and the Rhine and, and, and attack Rome and the Roman Empire. So it's a, it's a defensive war to start, but then it becomes a, a, an offensive punitive campaign to punish them for doing that. And then it becomes... Uh, a war of annihilation slash conquest. And at the end of 180, there's the idea that Marcus Aurelius would have conquered all of Dacia. So when Trajan makes um, Dacia, there's the province of Dacia and then there's free Dacia above it, which is the non-conquered area, which of course is problems because those people, you know, try and fight Rome again. Uh, and there's this idea that within a year, Marcus Aurelius would have conquered everything and, and created a new province. Hard to say, you know, he's been warring for 15 years. Would he have done it in a year or is that done simply because he dies and we don't know? Uh, and Commodus then makes this unfavorable peace and goes and does other things. Uh, having said that, you know, the, the, the frontier is relatively quiet. 
under communists. He does build the column uh, to commemorate the wars. Weirdly, he's not on it, which surely if he's this bad emperor you're telling us about, he's he's taking credit for things and he's not there. You know, and some people argue um, there's there's four panels that survive of of a of a uh, a victory arch, which seem to have had Commodus in them, and he's been erased, and so those those are fascinating because they're they're you know a sign of the damnatio memoriae of um, of Commodus. Uh, so is that one? Yeah, that's one. So you get things like that, which are the panels, which are glorious uh, evidence of the legions at the time. But there's this gap where where Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus might have been. Uh, sorry, not Lucius Verus, um, Commodus. So it's tricky. So why don't you tell us uh, how can we get our hands on uh, your book? Uh, well, any any good bookshop uh, should have a copy. Uh, Amazon has it, and Osprey, obviously, the Osprey uh, Bloomsbury website. You can get it. It's uh, I think it's fourteen ninety fifteen ninety nine in the UK. Uh, and is it available uh, as we speak? It should be available as we speak. It's got a release date of the 15th of January, 2024. So I think so. Uh, Very good. And it's it's also interesting. Now, I do, oh, I've got so much, so much to mention, a bit like the book. Um, one of the fascinating issues with the Roman legionary is, of course, the column. Uh, and just like Trajan's column, you've got inaccuracies in the way that the artist has shown the Roman legionaries. So, for instance, on the column of Marcus Aurelius, everyone has an oval shield. And so we think that at this point in time, everyone should have a curved rectangular shield and that the oval shields are, re are reserved for the Praetorian Guard. And yet on the column, everyone's got one, except for one scene of a testudo, which echoes the scene on Trajan's column of a testudo. And I think that the reason for the artist choosing to do that isn't a, a, a reflection of the change in of, of Roman equipment. It's to differentiate the column of Marcus Aurelius from its, you know, more famous cousin, the column of, of Trajan. And that, so it's to uh, make it look different. And so differentiating artistic choice rather than historical evidence, especially when we don't have a literary source that can give us a balance to the visual and the visually persuasive evidence of the column is is a tricky one was marcus aurelius's army still largely that of augustus meaning if you looked at the army that he led to war in the late second century a.d would it have still been much what augustus had or trajan uh when when did the big change maybe uh occur well the there's there's a bunch of reforms that occur under septimius severus um the severan reforms so the second century ad army really is the same in appearance um as i say the the vexillations of the army rather than legions fighting which has been you know up to a certain point uh in trajan's wars you get legions and then suddenly it becomes vexillations under Marcus Aurelius. That that happens, but I think in appearance, you know, and this is this is ignoring all the arguments about typologies of armor and typologies of helmet. They're very similar. That that the 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 legions are using probably rectangular scutai scut, scutarum. What's the plural of scutum? Anyway, um, the plural of shields. Um, and so they they're using uh, what we call lorica segmentata, the banded armor, but also hamata and uh, squamata, so scaled armor, um, male armor, and segmented armor. By the third century, it would seem as though this, the banded armor, the the famous look of a classic Roman legionary, has stopped. That that they seem to wear much more male armor than than other types, and scale armor as well. But in this period, you've still got the the, the classic Roman legionary look of, of uh, banded armor. The thing that's beginning to come in at this period is the the shorter gladius sword is beginning to drop out of fashion, and everyone seems to be wanting to adopt the the longer spatha, uh, which is initially a, a barbarian weapon that becomes the Roman cavalry sword, a longer sword. Uh, that's not fully in force yet, but it certainly is by the third century AD that, that Romans, even legionaries, are using longer spathi 
at this point in time, it's probably in a transition. And it may well be that, you know, when you're attacking Roman, uh, the enemies of Rome who have these longer swords, your shorter swords aren't cutting the mustard, so to speak, and that desire to have a longer sword. And it, it's also an interesting one because of the, the famous anecdotes you get about the the uh, ubiquity and the utility of the shorter Roman sword is against Gallic swords, which bend in combat, and you know, going back centuries. But the smelting of iron and tempering of iron has improved in barbarian cultures from that time. And so those swords are as good as the iron working of the Romans, but longer. And so I think there's that shift. And so in appearance, yes, in performance and organization, there's there's shifting beginning to happen. And as I say, the, 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 big, the beginnings of the barbarization of the Roman army, I think, sit with Marcus Aurelius's wars, uh, which is brought out through the plague and the manpower crisis. But I think that's where the the problems that will bring the Roman Empire to its knees in the fourth century begin with Marcus Aurelius. And so, you know, it's wonderful to look back and see someone like Edward Gibbon begin to trace the fall of the Roman Empire from Marcus Aurelius's death. I think you just, just shift it back a little bit further. It's actually during the reign of the last of these good emperors that actually the decline has started. But no one sees it as a decline yet. It's kind of an embryonic, uh, you know, the, the fetus of the fall. Oh, nice phrase, Murray. It, it's beginning to grow in the womb of Rome. Oh, it's ending with poetry. Anyone who's stuck to the end of this, yeah, love it. Anyway. It, uh, it sounds like a fascinating book, and I uh, recommend it to everyone. So uh, thank you, Murray, for uh, joining me today. Uh, once again, uh, the book is Barbarian Warrior versus Roman Legionary, Mark Romanic Wars, AD 165 to 180, and it's from Osprey Publishing. So go uh, find it and read it.